Hey everyone, welcome to the next video uh, on basic uh, physiology before we get into the actual or in preparation for uh, the first aid training. Uh, and this video is going to be on the respiratory system. You should have already watched the video on the heart and the next video is going to be on the circulatory system. And remember these three videos are basically meant to allow you to understand some of the key elements for how the human body functions so that you are then better able to provide care for somebody in an emergency situation. So when we talk about the respiratory system, what we're really talking about is the upper and lower airway, the functioning of the lungs. So that's what we're going to go through. And then we're going to cover a little bit of pathophysiology, a little bit of sort of what can go wrong with the respiratory system, um, just to give you some sense of how this all kind of comes together. So first thing I want to do is point out that when we talk about first aid, one of the key things we talk about is ABCs, these fundamental um, priorities that we deal with with first aid, airway, breathing, and circulation. These have been around for decades. I was taught these back in the 80s when I first learned first aid, and they're still the keys. What this means is if you run across somebody and they need first aid, maybe they're unresponsive, maybe they're unconscious, whatever, some of the first things you want to be concerned with is, do they have a clear airway? Are they breathing adequately? And do they have good circulation? Is the heart functioning, essentially? You also want to be concerned with other things like, do they have massive bleeding, et cetera? Are they in a dangerous situation? So remembering the ABCs is critical because it reminds you of the things you really need to look at when some, you find somebody in an emergency situation. The reason I point this out now is both A and B really require that you understand the way the respiratory system functions. A is a clear airway, meaning that they can get air in and out of their lungs. And B is that they are adequately breathing. Basically, these are two of the key priorities because if somebody doesn't have a clear airway and if they're not breathing, they're not gonna survive for very long. So we need to prioritize those functions. This is what the upper airway looks like. Now, when we talk about the airway, we generally break it up into an upper airway, which is the part up here, and a lower airway, which is the part down here. The upper and lower airway are typically divided by this right here, which is called the epiglottis. So in the upper airway, we're including the nose, the sinus cavity, the oral cavity, um, and then the uh, upper part that leads down to uh, the trachea, which is the windpipe that allows you to breathe. The reason I like this slide and I wanted to show this to you is it shows two critical functions. One is the epiglottis and the other here is the uvula. So the uvula is that funky thing on the back of your throat that hangs down, at least that's the very end of your uvula. And this whole part here of the uvula is kind of a soft tissue that flaps up and down. The reason for that is when you swallow, it flaps up and allows stuff to make sure it goes down rather than swallowing and allowing things to go up into your sinuses. You've probably had a situation, maybe when you were like eight, where you were drinking milk and then you laughed and milk came out of your nose, right? Well, that's basically a failure of your uvula. You, so the uvula creates a flap, but if you put some pressure on it with milk or another liquid and you're laughing, you'll kind of push some uh, fluid past that into your sinus cavity. But basically that's meant to protect your sinus cavity. Probably more important and more critical from our perspective is the epiglottis. The epiglottis is the same kind of flap, but it's right here and it's protecting your windpipe, your trachea, that's what it's called, from getting food or fluids in. So whenever you swallow, that epiglottis is like a flap that flaps down, covers your windpipe, so the food and the fluid goes here into the esophagus which is the thing that goes to your stomach and allows you to swallow. The esophagus is just like a flexible kind of hose. So imagine it like a hose, but a hose that collapses completely. So when food goes through, it'll open up and it'll push that food through, but it doesn't stay open all the time. The trachea right here is open all the time and it has cartilage around it that kind of holds it open so that air can easily go in and out of your lungs. And it's got that cartilage is sort of C cartilage. So right here, you've got kind of like half circle, more than a half circle, but whatever, a C-shaped cartilage in the front of your trachea. The back doesn't have cartilage because the back is where the esophagus is. And again, that flexible pipe needs to be able to expand when you swallow a lot of food. So if you had cartilage there, it wouldn't be able to expand. So it pushes into the space where your trachea is to allow you to swallow. This is actually kind of critical to understand. And you probably already understand it because at some point you probably 
tried to swallow too much hamburger, too many French fries at one time, maybe a big old bite of hot dog, and it kind of got stuck and took its time working its way down your esophagus. And you're kind of like, uh, is this going to go down? Yeah, it's a tight fit and it's pushing against the back of your trachea and working its way down uh, into your stomach. The reason people can choke sometimes so they can swallow food or other things and choke is often because they are trying to talk at the same time that they're trying to eat. Eating requires that epiglottis flap to be down and blocking your windpipe, but talking requires to be up to allow air to go through and allow you to speak. So if you're eating that hot dog at the same time that you're trying to talk, the epiglottis is moving up to allow you to talk, the hot dog's coming down, and it's going to go into your windpipe. And that's what's going to cause you to choke. And we're going to talk when we talk about um, CPR, we're going to talk about how to clear that, how to save somebody from a choking situation. But the first thing you have to recognize is that they are in fact choking. And one of the clear signs is that they can't speak or maybe can't cough because their windpipe is blocked. If somebody can tell you they're choking, they're probably not choking. And if they can cough, then their windpipe is not totally blocked and it's better to just let them cough. So if somebody is choking and they're coughing, best thing you can do for them is not compress or you know pushing against their abdomen to get the air out or you know knocking them in the back or anything like that. Best thing you can do is encourage them to cough. And that coughing hopefully will dislodge the, the object. Okay, so that's the upper respiratory tract. One thing we want to notice here is how to open an airway. I talked about the ABCs and the key is A, that first one, and that's an open airway. Basically, if somebody is unconscious or laying down on their back, they may have a blocked airway. And you would notice this because you at some point have probably laid on your back and not on a pillow. Uh, and you know that it's kind of hard to breathe if your head is kind of pushed forward. If you push your head back, it opens up the airway and allows you to breathe more easily. So the first thing you want to do is, let's say you're hiking down the trail and you run across somebody who's unconscious uh, in a supine position, meaning they're on their back in the trail, is to open their airway or make sure their airway is open. You're going to do that by holding their head, just as it shows there, and tilting their head back to make sure they have an open airway. The reason for that is, and you can see here in this image, if you do that, you will allow for that open trachea pathway and move the epiglottis into an open position and also move the tongue and the back of the mouth out of the way, allowing air to come in. Really important point here. Children don't have the same geometry for their airway as adults do. Children tend to have a much larger epiglottis, big old floppy epiglottis, and they tend to have a tongue that is larger as a proportion of their overall mouth. As a result of that, if you tilt their head back, you may actually cause more of a blockage. So what you want to do in that particular case is not tilt their head back, maybe just slightly or into a neutral position and ensure that they have an open airway. But unlike adults, tilting their head all the way back to provide an open airway may actually cause more of a problem. So no overextension for children, but an extension for adults to ensure they have an open airway. We will also, when we meet in person, talk about exceptions to this. So for example, if somebody has what we call a C-spine injury, a potential injury to their cervical spine up here, we may not want to extend their neck backwards because that may cause greater injury. So if somebody, I don't know, fell off a cliff and is laying on their back, they have a potential spinal injury, we will show I'll show you a different way of ensuring they have an open airway rather than that extension. Having said that, if you can't get an open airway in any other means, then that head tilt lift is what you need to do to get an open airway for them. Okay, there's that esophagus, and you can see that the esophagus goes into the stomach, and here you can see in this image right there, you got the trachea, um, with the epiglottis up here, and then you've got here, the esophagus. The reason I want you to see this is I want you to appreciate that these two are connected with each other. So when you are giving somebody breaths, let's say in CPR, when you're providing respirations, you wanna make sure that you're just providing enough respiration to get their chest to rise. This is what the Red Cross training will tell you to do. It's what I'm gonna tell you to do in person. And it's really important that you do that because if you provide too much air, what will happen is the excess air won't continue to fill their lungs. 
it will likely go down their esophagus and into their stomach, and you will fill their stomach with air. That's problematic for a few reasons, but one of the key reasons is that they might then burp or vomit. And if somebody is on their back, unable to breathe, you're trying to give them CPR and then they vomit, that makes things a whole lot harder to maintain an open, what we call a patent airway. So you give them just enough of a breath to see a chest rise and no more. And ideally in such a scenario, you are not pushing air down their esophagus into their GI system and potentially causing vomit. Here's the lungs. Basically, now we're getting into the lower airway, and you've got the um, trachea here that divides into two. Whoops. Okay, this picture is just as good. Um, divides into two at the what's called the carina. You don't need to know that, but from there, it splits off into the right and to the left. This makes it look like it's symmetrical. It's really not. The move to the right is less um, abrupt than the move to the left, but whatever. Um, it breaks off to the right and the left, and then it breaks off into smaller passageways. So it starts with the bronchi, which are relatively large, and then it gets into the bronchioles, tiny little pathways, and in throughout the lung tissue. You might imagine the lungs to be something like a balloon. They aren't. Think of them more like a sponge. They are filled substances with a lot of surface area to allow effective air, ex excuse me, air exchange. When you breathe in and out, there's two muscular systems that are allowing you to do that. One is the diaphragm here in the lower part of your body, and the other is your chest muscles. When your chest muscles expand out, that draws air into your lungs, obviously. When your diaphragm contracts down, that draws air into your lungs. And if you are an athlete, you've probably already run across this because some trainer or coach has already talked to you about belly breathing and chest breathing and how to more effectively uh, breathe. And if you are, by the way, a serious athlete on cross country or any other kind of sports team, uh, and you haven't put in some focused work on your breathing, you should, because it'll make you a better athlete. These are muscles that are just as important to running as the muscles in your legs, so you definitely want to train them. Okay, if you look here on the right of your screen, you're going to see those parts then, where it divides up is the carina, then it goes into the bronchi, the bronchioles, which is the smaller passageways, and then at the end, it stops in alveoli, alveolus, singular, alveoli, plural. The alveoli are the very end of the pathway, which are kind of like grape-like clusters. They're small little cells, I'll show you in a second, that allow the exchange of air with the blood supply. But before we get to that, I want to point out the pleural cavity, because that's going to actually be important in terms of first aid for us. The lungs are expanding open and closed, or whatever, it, op, up, out, and back, out, and back. And it's doing that against other tissue chest muscle, muscles, et cetera. The heart is there, et cetera. There's gotta be some way for those two to slide next to each other. If there isn't, then the lungs would be attached to the chest muscle. And when the chest expands, the lungs would sort of stretch and break. It'd be a terrible, terrible thing. It'd be painful to breathe. You couldn't survive that way. Instead, the lungs are surrounded kind of like by two garbage bags. Imagine <laughs> two garbage bags with a little bit of oil in between the two layers of garbage bag. So now that's sort of what's surrounding the lungs is two layers of tissue with a little bit of fluid called pleura fluid between the two. And that allows for a relative movement between the lungs and the things around the lungs. And that allows the lungs to open and close and open and close without causing you know, surrounding tissue damage. So that's basically the lower airway, except for the alveoli. And here are the alveoli. So at the end of those passageways where the bronchioles end, they end at these like, this is what I said, grape-like clusters. These little tiny chambers with a lot of surface area defined by membrane. And on one side of the membrane is your blood supply right here. And on the other side of the membrane is your air supply coming into your lungs. And what happens is the oxygen is able to be exchanged from the incoming air into your blood. And the reason for that is the difference in pressure between the two. So basically you've got about 20% oxygen uh, coming into your lungs and the oxygen available in the blood is less than that. So the oxygen pressure, if you'd like, goes from the air into your blood supply. At the same time, by the way, carbon dioxide is going from your blood supply 
back into your lungs to be exhaled. So you inhale oxygen, that gets absorbed by your blood supply, and then your blood supply puts carbon dioxide into the air in your lungs and you exhale carbon dioxide. You might at this point reasonably ask, where's the carbon dioxide coming from? The carbon dioxide is the waste product, if you'd like, of cellular metabolism. So throughout your body are cells that are using energy. They're using oxygen and carbon in order to produce energy, much the same way you have for a fire. You probably at some point took a chemistry course and they pointed out that you have oxygen plus carbon and the end result is carbon dioxide. That's what combustion is. That's also happening in your body. That's what's happening in your muscle tissue. That's what's happening in your organ tissues, et cetera. That carbon dioxide then goes into the blood supply and it works its way back toward the lungs and the lungs have to get rid of that carbon dioxide. This is actually kind of important to note because what's interesting is that people often imagine that their rate of breathing is controlled by a lack of oxygen. So for example, I don't know, you go out uh, free diving and you're down in the water, you're 15 feet down and you start feeling like, oh, I really need air. And what you're imagining is, oh my God, my body's really telling me I need air. What your body's really telling you is you have too much carbon dioxide. It's likely that if you're a healthy person, the carbon dioxide response happens before the oxygen response. So, or for example, if you go out running and you start running and your body responds by having you breathe faster, what triggered the breathing faster? Probably not a lack of oxygen, probably a higher level of carbon dioxide. And your body responds by saying, we got to get rid of all this excess carbon dioxide. Where's all the excess carbon dioxide coming from? You are working your muscles. Your muscles are metabolizing energy more quickly, producing more carbon dioxide, and your body needs to get rid of that carbon dioxide. So you're breathing fast to expel all that excess carbon dioxide. This is actually a good thing in a healthy body because the carbon dioxide level will go up faster than the oxygen level. So it allows you to respond to stresses much more quickly. So you can go out running and immediately you start breathing faster and accommodating the fact that you're using more energy uh, and you need to expel more carbon dioxide. In certain people that have certain illnesses, that kind of hypercapnic drive, that's what it's called. It's right here, hypercapnic. Hyper means high. Capnic means carbon dioxide. So high carbon dioxide level is what's driving your respiratory rate. That kind of drive can be compromised. So say, for example, if somebody spends 30 years smoking, or by the way, vaping, that can actually expose their body to higher levels of carbon dioxide, potentially higher levels of carbon monoxide, potentially higher other kinds of toxins. And as a result of that, their body gets used to those higher levels and that carbon dioxide drive, that hypercapnic drive is no longer working for them. In which case they become dependent on the hypoxic drive. There is a hypoxic drive. So when you lack oxygen, that will also drive a faster respiratory rate. It's just in a healthy person that tends to be a more secondary drive. However, in an unhealthy person that maybe has been smoking for 30 years and has been exposed to the carbon dioxide of smoking and has a high base carbon dioxide level in their body, that hypercapnic drive isn't working. So they are a hypoxic breather, if you'd like. Uh, basically, their breathing is controlled by the lack of oxygen. As a result of that, they can actually have some uh, real problems. Among others, if you're in emergency services, is giving them oxygen may be tricky because if you give them oxygen, their body may be thinking, oh, cool, now I've got oxygen. I don't need to breathe anymore, or at least not as aggressively. That's a little bit too much for this class, but realize that what's basically driving people, uh, driving the respiratory rate, is the lack of carbon dioxide. That may be relevant as we're providing uh, first aid. Okay, putting that all in a system then, what have we got? We got the lungs here. So we have the heart right there. We've got the superior and inferior vena cava connected to the venous system. That creates, or I'm sorry, that's taking deoxygenated blood, bringing it into the right side of the heart. That blood goes out to the lungs through the alveoli, Oxygen is exchanged with the blood. So oxygen goes into the blood. Carbon dioxide comes out of the blood. You inhale oxygen. You exhale carbon dioxide. The blood is now enriched with oxygen. That goes back into the left side of the heart. And from there, it gets pumped throughout the whole 
circulatory system. We'll talk about the circulatory system in the next video, but that's basically the function of the lungs, to allow oxygenation of the blood and to allow the release of carbon dioxide. Let's talk a little bit about when that doesn't go right. What we mean is pathophysiology. Remember, physiology is the functioning of um, the body systems. So we often talk about anatomy and physiology. Anatomy is the structure of the human body. Physiology is how those systems, those structures function. Patho means that it is dysfunctional or um, ill or compromised. So like pathology is, or a pathological liar, uh, whatever, um, is something that is not functioning properly or has an illness to it or a disease process. So pathophysiology, uh, a diseased physiological system. One of the key ones here is asthma. Interestingly, asthma is sort of a couple of dynamics to it. What happens with asthma is that the, um, the bronchi get inflamed. So they get, as you can see here, swollen. And as a result of that, the airway, the channel for the movement of air gets much smaller. And you get mucus buildup in the bronchi as well. And the mucus buildup basically comes from the fact that the bronchi tissue expand and get inflamed and it's easier for fluids to get into the um, bronchi. Uh, and those fluids also block um, the movement of air. So people with asthma have real trouble inhaling, especially exhaling air because those bronchi are getting more and more swollen and the pathways are getting smaller and smaller. People don't uh, catch asthma. Rather, asthma is something you're predisposed toward. It's something you're born with. Having said that, not everybody who has potential asthma knows they have asthma. Asthma can be triggered by a lot of different environmental factors. It can be triggered by air pollution. It can be triggered by pet dander. It can be triggered by exercise. It can be triggered by artificial scents. Um, so a lot of different things that can create this difficulty breathing. If you've never been exposed to that particular thing, you wouldn't think of yourself as having asthma. So if uh, you could potentially have an asthmatic reaction to air pollution, but you live out in the country in the mountains where there is no air pollution, you could live your whole life and say, I don't have asthma. But if you went to Los Angeles, you might have an asthmatic attack. You don't therefore catch asthma by going to Los Angeles. It was already a predisposition, but rather you have the asthmatic uh, experience as a result of being exposed to the environmental trigger. Um, the reason that recognition is important is because you may run across somebody who says they don't have asthma, who truly believes they don't have asthma, and for all intents and purposes does not have asthma, except they're having an asthmatic attack. Because maybe their asthmatic attack is the result of exercise, and they don't do much exercise, but they decided they were gonna get out there and get a little bit of exercise, and their first experience with exercise was gonna be hiking a 5,000 foot mountain. This might sound ridiculous, but believe me, I have been involved in rescues where people with absolutely no experience have done things uh, far crazier than that. I once actually had a family of five uh, decide for their first hiking trip, they were gonna hike to the base of the Grand Canyon and back 13 miles each way, 5,000 feet, no more than that, I guess, uh, whatever it is, 6,000 feet of elevation change. That was gonna be their first hiking experience. Uh, so people do crazy things. So you may run across somebody who's having an asthmatic attack and you say, wow, look, seems like you have asthma. And they're gonna say, no, no, I don't have asthma. Yeah, you do. <laughs> um, so you wanna kind of be aware of that as well. Or it could be an environmental trigger that they weren't exposed to before. So they're in a particular situation uh, where there may be some trigger, pollen, for example, that they have not been exposed to before that's triggering an asthmatic attack. Uh, but often it's exercise. And typically if somebody's an athlete and they like running or whatever, and they have some kind of exercise induced asthma, you can deal with that with an inhaler. And we'll talk about uh, when we get together and uh, do the CPR training, actually, uh, the use of an inhaler. And I'll train you on how to use those so that if somebody has one of those, you can help them use them because obvious, uh, often when somebody is having an asthmatic attack, uh, they're a little too panic stricken to use their inhaler properly. And frankly, there are even folks that have regular asthmatic attacks who just don't know how to use their inhaler properly. So you can help them. 
Another possibility that's out there is COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And this might sound familiar because you may have seen a commercial um, for medication for COPD. Uh, and the reason for that, or maybe a CPAP machine, which is a machine that allows you to sleep by conti providing continuous air pressure into your lungs. And I'll explain why that's a good thing. Um, but the reason that these um, are around is well, first, to some degree, because uh, there are more medications that help people deal with this, but also because there's a lot of people that are now in their 60s and 70s have been smoking for the past 40 plus years who are experiencing COPD. So what is COPD? It's really two things combined. One is bronchitis, and bronchitis is the chronic inflammation, which with excessive mucus of the bronchioles, that makes sense bronchitis, bronchioles, itis means inflammation. So inflammation of the bronchioles is bronchitis. And that inflammation is coupled with excess mucus. That makes it really hard to breathe as we talked about with asthma. And then also worked in there is emphysema. Emphysema is very different. Emphysema isn't the bronchioles, it's the alveoli. And it's a physical deterioration of the alveoli. So the healthy alveoli we talked about before, and you can see it right here, um, has a lot of cells with a lot of surface area for the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. In damaged alveoli that have been exposed to a lot of toxins like cigarette smoke, or by the way, vaping, um, you can see the alveolar uh, membranes break down and you just have less surface area and you've got more scar tissue in the alveoli and less capacity to exchange gases. Both of those then combine to create COPD. Either of those can exist independently, but they can also and frequently do uh, exist combined and sometimes combine also with um, asthma. So you may run across somebody um, who's experiencing some effects because they basically have a modest uh, COPD and they've overexerted themselves. Um, Another cool historical fact, this you don't need to know this, but it's just crazy cool, is iron lung machines. And this gives you some sense of also how breathing works. Back in the day when polio was a serious problem, people had basically uh, muscular dysfunction that meant they couldn't breathe. If your diaphragm doesn't work, if your chest muscles don't work, you can't expand and contract your lungs and therefore you can't breathe. And so the way to solve this was to put them in a mechanism like this, which was like a pressurized chamber with their head outside the chamber, the rest of their body inside the chamber, and then reduce the pressure in the chamber, increase the pressure in the chamber. And that would expand and contract their lungs. Basically, you reduce the pressure outside their body and their chest expands. You increase the pressure and their chest contracts. And that causes air to go in and out of their lungs, allowing them to breathe. There were hundreds of these in any given ward. I mean, you can see pictures from the 1930s and 40s when you had like, you know, maybe 100 people in a ward with nurses caring for them all in iron lungs. Some of the times people had to be in those for a few hours a day. Sometimes people had to be in those all day. And in fact, I think the last person uh, in an iron lung only died like eight or 10 years ago, um, but survived in an iron lung for a long time. And I think had to be in that lung for like, I don't know, 12 or 14 hours a day, believe it or not, as crazy as that is. So happily, polio, thing of the past, iron lungs no longer necessary. However, while you're unlikely to find somebody in an iron lung out uh, in the wilderness, you might somebody find somebody experiencing trauma. So we should talk a little bit about how trauma relates to the respiratory system as well. One of the key ways that happens is through a pneumothorax. Pneumo means air, like a pneumatic tool. It's a tool that runs on air. Pneumo means air. Thorax is your chest cavity. So pneumothorax is air in your chest cavity. Air in your lungs, good. Air in your chest cavity, not good. So basically what this is, is you've got some kind of trauma, usually a penetrating trauma, like let's say, I don't know, a knife, a spear, an ax, a stick, um, stuck in your chest, which creates a hole in your pleura cavity. Remember the pleura cavity? Those two garbage bags with a little bit of oil in between, that pleura uh, fluid. Okay. That's separating your chest cavity from your lungs, right? You get a hole in that. Now, when you try to breathe, when your chest expands, air gets sucked in through the hole, filling that pleural cavity and displacing the air in your lungs. So your chest is going in and out, but air is not going into that lung. Instead, air is going in and out of that pleural cavity, which doesn't allow you to breathe. That, you might guess, is a problem. 
It's called a sucking chest wound because as you expand and contract, you will see the air sucking into that chest wound, right? We also sometimes call that a collapsed lung. Again, lungs are not balloons. So it's not like the lung goes down to nothing, but rather the lung will kind of push in as the air pressure pushes against the lung. So the person is trying to breathe, but they can't get any air in and out of that lung. The expansion and contraction, what we call ventilation. So to be clear in terms of terminology, ventilation means go air going in and out of your lung. Respiration is the exchange of gases at the alveoli. So that ventilation isn't happening because you've got that compromise that's allowing air to come in from the outside of your chest rather than through your respiratory system. Some symptoms of this are going to be obviously some kind of trauma in the chest or, you know, the size of the chest somewhere in your um, thoracic region. Um, chest pain, shallow breathing, maybe the patient pant can't breathe, probably tachycardia. Tachycardia means fast heart rate, tachy as in tachometer, moving really fast. And cardia, meaning heart, so the heart is moving really fast, that's tachycardia. So you might have a heart rate of 150, 160, something like that, really high uh, heart rate. Why? Because your body has recognized that it's not getting adequate circulation of oxygenated blood, and it's trying to accommodate that by pumping really, really fast to get more oxygenated blood out there. Ain't going to work because the blood's not getting oxygenated, but that's how your body's going to try to compensate for that. How do you fix it? Well, we'll talk about this later and I'll show you in person what these look like, but we're gonna use a three-sided dressing. Basically, this is gonna be an occlusive dressing, so a dressing that doesn't allow air to pass through it, not like gauze, but maybe gauze soaked in petroleum jelly, maybe a sheet of plastic even. If you are in a tough situation, you could do this with um, uh, duct tape and a piece of plastic. Put it over the hole, tape it on three sides, leave one side open, and it becomes like a little vent. Air can get out, air can't come in. So when the chest expands, air can't come in and fill the pleura cavity. And that might allow the person enough back pressure to be able to actually breathe. We'll talk about that more again. I'll show you that. Here's an x-ray of a pneumothorax. In these kinds of x-rays, what you want to look for is where there is a lack of something. So you can see here on the patient's right side, you've got sort of this gray hazy area. That's the lung. X-rays are really good at showing muscle, or I'm sorry, on bone, not as good at showing muscle and tissue. So in this case, you can see the ribs, uh, but in between the ribs, you can see where the lung is because it's a relatively dense tissue. And then right here, you see it's all black. That is the absence of lung. <laughs> um, and that is because you've got air filling that thoracic cavity, which means the lung is right limited over here, that collapsed lung. Again, it's not a balloon. It's not just a tiny nothing lung, but it's not adequate to provide breathing. You'll also notice, by the way, that this is the trachea and it's deviated off to the side. It ends up being pulled to the side of the collapsed lung. So one way of recognizing if somebody has a pneumothorax is you're gonna have a deviated trachea, that it's going to be kind of pulled to the side of where the collapsed lung is. Cool, right? Okay. One of the things you need to get used to doing is basically recognizing and assessing adequate breathing in a victim when you first see them. So you're hiking down the trail and you run across somebody sitting on the side of the trail. One of the first things that should be running in your head, if this is a, particular, a potentially injured person, is how are they breathing? Do they have an open airway? Remember the ABCs, that A, number one is an open airway. Number B is adequately breathing, right? So as you even walk up to them, you want to assess this. One super easy way to assess it is say, hey, how you doing? <laughs> and the reason is if they say, oh, I'm not doing that well. My chest really hurts. Okay, they just gave you a full sentence. So maybe they have some problem with their chest, but they have a patent that is say an open and functional airway because they were able to give you a full sentence. On the other hand, if the person says, I'm, I'm not doing too good, that's what we call one or two word dyspnea. Dyspnea is dysfunctional breathing. Remember, pneumonia means air, right? So dyspnea is dysfunctional breathing. And in this case, it's a clear sign that they have trouble breathing because they can't even get a couple of words out without having trouble um, with their lungs. Okay. Other things you can use to recognize, besides just the fact that they're clearly struggling to breathe, is muscle retraction. So to get a sense of the severity of their breathing restriction, you might look to see whether the skin is tight here and in the chest region because the muscles are strained, trying to basically 
pull up and provide enough vacuum to suck air into the lungs. You might look for pale skin. Normal skin is not pale. Normal skin is pink and warm. If the skin is cool and damp, that's a problem. Cyanosis is a real problem. Cyanosis means blue skin. So in the extremities, especially the fingers, maybe the toes, maybe around the mouth, maybe around the eyes, you start to see blue skin. That is a sign that you're not getting oxygenated blood out to the extremities. And you can see there a picture to your lower right of blue fingertips. That's a clear sign of cyanosis. It's not a hard word to remember because cyan is the color blue. Cyanosis is blue on your body, right? And the tripod position is also a real indicator. And you've probably been in the tripod position. Maybe you ran a few miles at a faster rate than you probably were ready for. And then you're like this. That's the tripod position. People kind of naturally do that to kind of keep their lungs open up. They kind of bend over like that and kind of op try to open up their airway. You see somebody in that situation, that's a real indication uh, that they're having trouble breathing. You want to be able to evaluate their airway and make sure you get that patent open, clear airway. And don't be fooled by what we call agonal gasp. If somebody is laying down semi-conscious and they're going, <gasps> That is not breathing. Those are agonal gas. That's the body desperately trying to breathe, but failing. So you don't count that as breathing. You don't then say, oh, they're breathing. So let's see what else is wrong with them. That is inadequate breathing. You want to open up an airway and possibly provide them uh, with emergency respirations. Normal breathing has certain characteristics to it. And you want to recognize these. It has a normal rate, a good quality depth of respiration, and a regular rhythm. And you want to look for all three of those, rate, quality, and rhythm. When we talk about pulse later, we're also going to talk about rate, quality, and rhythm. It's not just that the pulse has to be at the right rate, but you want it to be regular. You want it to be a good, strong quality. In terms of breathing, for an adult, a uh, normal respiratory rate is 12 to 20 breaths per minute. For a child, it's much more than that. A child normally breathes at 20 to 30 breaths per minute. That's important to remember. And the younger the child goes, the faster the respiratory rate could be. So if it's a newborn infant, maybe you know six months old, something like that, the respiratory rate might be 30, 35. That's, that's fine. On the other hand, if you run across an adult and they have a respiratory rate of 35, that's a problem. If you have a child and they have a respiratory rate of eight, that'd be a problem for an adult, but it's a big problem for a child. So you want to deal with that right away. So do commit these numbers to memory, 12 to 20 for an adult, 20 to 30 for a child, because you're going to be able to have to assess how that child and how that adult are breathing to know whether they need help with their breathing, not just opening their airway. But if you have an adult, you open their airway and they're having eight breaths per minute, you have to recognize that's a problem. They're not breathing adequately. And even though they're breathing, you may need to assist them with their breathing in order to assure they're getting adequate oxygenation. The other possibility that's out there, by the way, is that somebody might be um, breathing too much. They might be over oxygenated. Um, and in that case, you may actually have to slow their breathing somewhat. And there are people that are prone toward that kind of excessive ventilation. Um, so somebody might be having a panic attack, for example, if they got lost in the woods and then you run across them, uh, somebody might've had a very frightening situation. Maybe somebody in your crew, maybe somebody, you know, freaks out at night because they heard a bear or something like that. And they start breathing fast. Maybe they don't even recognize it. Frequently people will not recognize it. And the first symptoms they will recognize is they have tingling in their hands and their feet, or maybe they don't recognize a symbol, a system, a symptom at all, but you do, you recognize that they're kind of freaking out, or maybe they're not you know, they're losing um, full cognitive function. <laughs> um, what I mean is you might have somebody who's sort of not making rational sense. Maybe they have a headache, maybe not. Maybe they have tingling, maybe they don't. But there are reasons that they basically are hyperventilating. Uh, and again, for certain people, uh, the trigger is fairly low. So don't think that, oh, it's not a serious situation. Um, it could be a very serious situation. And don't think, well, that situation wasn't dramatic enough for that to hyperventilate. If somebody's prone to hyperventilation, the trigger might be relatively low. The old school solution that I was taught back in the day is put a bag on their mouth and have them rebreathe their own air. The logic is their air has got carbon dioxide in it, so they will reduce the amount of oxygen they're taking in. This is not an answer. So putting a bag over somebody's head while they're trying to breathe is not a way to solve the problem. It's probably going to freak them out and create more panic 
and make the situation worse, at least not make it better. A better thing to do is just coach them on their breathing. Relax them, assure them that things are going to be fine. Hey, you're fine. We know the way out of here. This is not a problem. I've dealt with bears before. Bears are not a problem. They're more scared of you than you are of them. Just relax. I got this under control. It's all going to be good. And then maybe coach them a little bit on their breathing. Breathe with them. Maybe start breathing closer to the rate they're breathing. And then slow your breathing along with theirs. So you might say to them, okay, breathe with me. We're going to breathe together. This is going to be good. We're going to take nice, deep breaths. And we're just going to try to relax. Here we go. And there you slow the breathing down, but kind of start a little closer to where they're at and work the breathing down and try to get them to slow their breathing. And as they slow their breathing and relax, the tingling in their extremities will go away. Um, the, the nervousness, the stress may go away. Um, maybe the panic attack will start to ease a little bit as well. Uh, this can be really important because there can be certain significant harm uh, to overoxygenation, believe it or not. Here's another cool kind of thing having to do with respiration that I just wanted to cover now. I could have covered it later, but um, it's related to breathing. So we're going to talk about now acute mountain sickness. Acute mountain sickness is basically based on the issue that when you go up high in altitude, there's less oxygen available for breathing. There's still the same percentage of oxygen in the air. So here uh, at sea level, there's 20, the air is about 20% oxygen. Uh, in Denver, at about a mile above sea level, it's about 20% oxygen. So you don't change the percent of ox oxygen, but rather the pressure is less in Denver. So the amount of stuff, all stuff, in a given cubic foot of air is less. As a result, there's less oxygen in the air, even though the percentage of oxygen as compared to the other stuff in the air, nitrogen, et cetera, is about the same. So what happens then is when you go at high altitude like that, when you hike up a mountain or when you fly into Denver, you might experience a relative deprivation in oxygen. And that might have some physiological effects. You might start to get a headache. You might start to get fatigued, which is one of the more common effects. You might start to feel like you can't really breathe as well. You might feel um, really unable to kind of like keep up. So I've led hiking trips in the Rocky Mountains before where I'll take a bunch of young folks, Stockton students, uh, and we start a hike. And like a mile into the hike, they're all like, mm -hmm. and they're like, I don't understand. Or I'm in better shape than this. Excuse me. Um, and I have to explain to them, yeah, but now you're at like 8,000 feet. So it's going to take some time getting used to that. The basic way to solve this is to allow time for acclimation. So there's less oxygen available. Some people, by the way, are going to be more predisposed to this and some people less predisposed to this. And it's not necessarily related to how good a shape you're in. So you could be in awesome shape. You could be a marathon runner and just predisposed toward uh, less oxygen. And you might otherwise be not that great shape. Don't exercise that much, but it, you're not predisposed toward it. So it's not going to affect you as much. So it's not just like if you're in bad shape, it's going to be a problem. If you're in good shape, it's not going to be a problem. Certainly, if you're in good shape, it'll help you deal with the issue better. But there's just certain predisposition that's going to affect you. The best thing to do is just let yourself acclimate. So if you're going to go hiking in the Rocky Mountains, fly in a couple of days ahead of time. Get yourself a couple of days to relax. Don't just sleep but rather keep breathing. The problem is if you sleep, you will slow your respiration and your acclimation will take more time. So instead, go for a gentle walk, hang out. Don't drink alcohol because you don't want to add the stress to your body when it's trying to acclimate to the low oxygen level. Don't take sleeping pills or anything like that. Same problem. You don't want to add to the stress of your body, but just give yourself a couple of days to get used to it. If you're driving to Denver some other thing, place, don't be in a hurry. Drive at a slower rate, stop a few places along the way, go see the giant ball of yarn or whatever the hell there might be on the way to Denver, I don't know, um, and uh, spend some time acclimating to the change in altitude. If you don't, then you might get acute mountain sickness, and that could even potentially uh, manifest as something like high altitude cerebral, cerebral edema, which is basically swelling and fluid around your brain, or, um, whoops, high altitude pulmonary edema, which is swelling around your lungs. And you know this because pulmonary means lungs and edema means swelling. Um, so what are the uh, symptoms of this? Well, 
basically you might um again arrive in denver or some other kind of place i don't know banff canada or some other high altitude kind of place and you might start coughing maybe you're having shortness of breath um you might rest and still feel like you're really having a shortness of breath that you really can't kind of get over um, maybe you're getting a little bit of chest pain maybe chest tightness etc what's bringing this on isn't entirely clear especially the cerebral edema but it basically has to do with a change in external pressure. And you can imagine your lungs, that makes some sense. If you've got less pressure of air on the inside of your lungs and the same pressure of blood on the outside, if you'd like, of the um, alveoli, then you're going to get fluid moving into those cavities. And that is going to create that edema. That's going to create that fluid in your lungs. It's going to make it more difficult for you to breathe. So the thing to do, and, and by the way, if this gets serious, you might actually get big fluid in your lungs. And you might get like a pink frothy sputum that's coming out when you cough. So the initial cough is likely to be unproductive. Um, but uh, if it continues, you might get more productive coughs. Productive cough doesn't mean it's a good cough. It just means you're producing some gross stuff out of your lungs. In such cases where you're getting pink sputum, et cetera, you definitely want to deal with it immediately. But even if you're getting severe shortness of breath and it doesn't go away after a short period of time, you want to deal with that as well. The best way to deal with that is just to lower in altitude. Uh, and there is no shame in this for God's sake. So I get it. You might be out for a hike and you really wanted to bag that 8,000 foot peak and you're at 6,000 feet and you're having trouble breathing and every time you take a step, it just like increases the problem you have with breathing. The solution is to stop increasing in altitude and go down in altitude and allow yourself to acclimate. And it may be that you're just not gonna bag that peak, at least not this time. That's fine. Way better than crashing at a high altitude. So uh, you have to allow yourself to acclimate and maybe you won't acclimate and you really want to avoid high altitude pulmonary edema and high altitude cerebral edema because those could be life threatening. And if you have symptoms of that, you want to seek treatment. In high altitude places like Denver, they're likely to have um, uh, hyperbaric chambers and I'll talk about that in a second. But this is an x-ray of pulmonary edema, which is kind of cool. You can see here in this x-ray, uh, remember, these are the lungs and there's a normal lung tissue. There's normal lung tissue. But look here, see how much fluid there is there or how much I should say white there is there? That is that excess fluid uh, building up in your lungs. And that's the problem uh, that you would need to deal with. So the one way to deal with it is just to put yourself in one of these chambers. And so if you go to certain places, they will have chambers like this. And if this doesn't look like fun, good, avoid this by dealing with uh, high altitude sickness appropriately. But in a severe situation, you would need to get one of these chambers and basically they increase the pressure in that chamber and allow your body uh, to acclimate back to uh, normal pressure. So that basically is the respiratory system. Um, we're next going to talk about the circulatory system for a little bit, and that will give you the background that you need to then start doing some more applied stuff. Having said that, we talked a lot about applied stuff uh, in uh, this lecture. So I will see you on the next lecture, uh, which is in circulatory system.